Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled Advances and Challenges in Vaccine Development and Manufacture, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Tony Diamor, Vice President of Product Research and Development at Sanofi Pasteur. My name is Stephen Edwards, and I will be your moderator. Now, please allow me to introduce our first presenter. Tony holds a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Windsor and an MBA from Wilfrid Laurier University. He joined Sanofi Pasteur in 1994 as a purification scientist. He has taken on successive leadership positions, including the Vice President of Bioprocess Research and Development in North America at Sanofi Pasteur, responsible for process development and the manufacture of clinical trial material. Since July 2015, Tony is Vice President, Global Product Research and Development, responsible for process and analytical development, the manufacture of clinical trial material, and the delivery of clinical supplies to the clinical trial sites. I will now be handing over to our presenter. Welcome, Tony. Thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. And as well, I want to thank the Biopharma Asia for the opportunity to present this. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you're located. And as uh, was mentioned, the title of the presentation is Advances and Challenges in Vaccine Development and Manufacture. Uh, and what I want to focus on uh, really is uh, several of the, uh, uh, review the constraints and complexities of vaccine product development and manufacture. Uh, the evolution of bioprocess and analytics uh, that we've seen over time and the technologies to overcome some of these challenges the strategy and leveraging innovation and technology for ra rapid uh, product development, and I will provide examples of, for some of that. And then just a quick peek in terms of what the uh, future uh, could look like. So again, just we'll focus first on the uh, constraints and complexities. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, vaccines, uh, this will not be a surprise to you, but just to give you uh, a background on vaccines for those who are not familiar, obviously vaccines are biologics uh, and they're products that are derived from living organisms. Uh, however, they are very complex entities in both in terms of uh, the components uh, and the technologies related to, to produce them. Uh, these vaccines, uh, uh, vaccines in general, are given as a prophylactic to prevent disease, whereas a number of, uh, let's say, uh, therapeutic uh, biologics or drugs are really uh, given to, uh, let's say, relieve uh, m medical conditions, um, and, and therefore vaccines, because they're given to healthy individuals, uh, require a high bar for safety. And again, as I'll talk more about it uh, through the slide deck, this really contributes in terms of the cost and the time in terms of making these vaccines. Uh, they are hard to make in a generic form. Uh, they, we know with technology, I would say it's getting a bit easier, but still they are difficult. And because of that, they do retain their commercial value um, a much longer time period. And for that, we've seen over time that there's been an increase in the number of pharmaceutical companies uh, acquiring vaccine um, divisions or groups. So this is just a snapshot on this slide in terms of uh, the, the vaccines are manufactured by a wide variety of cell substrates. You know, for example, they're made from mammalian cells, uh, insect cells, uh, microbial cells, fungal, avian, etc. And I've listed there a number of the different type of cells that are currently being used in terms of manufacturing both uh, products in development as well as licensed products. And, and related to this, not only is it just a wide variety of cell substrates, but it's the type of product that's obtained, obtained as, uh, as well, such as, you know, you could have a, a live virus, a live attenuated virus, inactivated viruses, uh, virus uh, lipoproteins, uh, uh, viral vectors, uh, conjugates, recombinant uh, bacterial proteins, synthetic peptides, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole host uh, of different type of cell substrates and related to cell, cell products uh, that are made, uh, that are used to make uh, vaccines. And with this then, uh, obviously is that vaccines and the type of vaccines are very diverse, whether it's a polysaccharide, DNA plasmid, protein complex, virus, et cetera. 
and therefore they have a wide variation in properties from one product to another, which require product characteri uh, characterizability, as we say, to be quite different between one product to another. And one of the disadvantages, or one could see it also as an advantage, is that there are very few platform processes to make vaccines. Unlike, uh, let's say, the current monoclonal antibodies which, uh, and products which have a more defined platform uh, for making them, and therefore it's more likely that these, these products are easier to make because they have similar processes and easier to characterize. So just to highlight on the next slide, and not to go into detail again, just the complexity uh, of the vaccine industry. Uh, it is a high cost and high risk environment, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll mention that a bit later. Uh, it is really entrenched in terms of uh, traditional vaccines from a regulatory environment, uh, where even on the market there's a number of older products that still uh, still exist, you know, using the same uh, pro uh, process that they were developed because it becomes much more difficult to change processes significantly uh, while it's licensed without having to repeat clinical trials. Uh, there's new vaccine targets, obviously, and the, and the technologies that are required to uh, make these new vaccines. Uh, compliance is getting uh, more, uh, let's say, more stringent and stringent over time uh, with the safety expectations. And it's a very competitive environment. Uh, so right now I highlight five major pharmaceutical companies. At what, one time there was greater than 10, approaching 15 different companies that produced uh, vaccines, and now it's narrowing down to uh, a smaller group and therefore more, more competitive. Uh, there are biotech companies emerging, emerging based on new technologies which um, are entering the market. And one of the major attractions is, of course, uh, the um, financial benefit of it, where it's estimated by the year 2025 that the vaccine market could approach or exceed 100 billion uh, U.S. dollars. Uh, on the next slide, I just want to give you a high-level view uh, of vaccine production. You know, and, and as you can see, it takes about 10 to 14 years, uh, on average, to produce a vaccine. From, let's say, from the entering the preclinical stage until it gets licensed. And, and over this time period, the success rate is approximately 10%. Uh, it's, a, it's just under 20% if we take it from phase one uh, licensing. And as I mentioned, the cost of about a billion dollars US. So you can see it's a very expensive, it's a very time con consuming uh, process in a complex and competitive industry. And some of the industry challenges and pressures that uh, we see are obviously the cost pressures uh, and the need for return on investment, the increase in competition. Uh, another big one is localized manufacturing, where a lot of these pro products are not, uh, not made from one big giant, um, let's say, factory, if you will, to supply, to supply globally, but made by several localized uh, manufacturing, which was really um, a result of evolution of the vaccine industry. And the quality requirements obviously are rigorous uh, from the start of phase one. And where we want to go is really into an environment where production, development, you have a much higher productivity, where you have much higher plant utilization, where you can really be much more agile and flexible with multiple products at different scales, uh, higher efficiency, obviously less less failure and waste, and really uh, achieving much higher quality manufacturing standards. And and one more addition in terms of the uh, complexity and cost is really around safety requirements. And this slide just uh, tries to show that over a period of time uh, that the number of people enrolled in phase three studies increased significantly. Some of this is related to the nature of the disease target uh, that's being addressed, uh, but it's really around the higher, higher costs of uh, running clinical trials, and this has really contributed into the significant cost of making a product. Uh, the next slide, I just really want to provide an overview of just, uh, let's say, high-level steps on the general approach to making vaccines. And so basically, during the course of uh, process development, one really strives to identify critical unit operations and parameters. 
that they will use to at least define the process for phase one clinical manufacture. And in this case, you would define the critical, critical unit operations uh, and a process that's amenable to scale up as you're approaching to phase, to phase two. And you want to be able to limit the number of changes uh, that occurs between those phases, or you may, may be required to repeat a toxicology study and maybe even repeat uh, a phase one study, depending on the degree of changes and the amount of information that you have available through a comparability uh, exercise. Uh, then after phase two, uh, there's the uh, going into phase three where you run your consistency lots, engineering runs, and really depending on, really are looking to transition this into manufacturing and product launch depending on the success of the clinical trial. And throughout of this, one is always doing physical chemical characterization to demonstrate product comparability uh, as an indicator of process scalability, but it, more importantly, to understand the product. When we looked, when we looked towards um, biotechnology and, let's say, the, um, the impact and the advantages of technology, this slide just tries to demonstrate in terms of the impact of technology and innovation on the number of, in this case, biological products and as well vaccines on the market over time. And really what we see is that, you know, it was fairly static in terms uh, of, of number of products until about the mid uh, to the 90s, 50s and 60s where we started to see a growth. And by 1980s when we had the booming of biotechnology, you can see the really almost exponential uh, growth of biologics on the market as we went through, you know, DNA, understanding the uh, DNA structure, producing monoclonal antibodies with the uh, implementation of PCR and then transgenics and cloning and then understanding the human genomic project has really, um, really escalated the number of products on the market. And you, if you one has to look, there's at least several hundred um, vaccine products um, addressing multiple diseases available on the market, and this is growing, as well as those that are addressing unmet medical needs. So moving forward, really around uh, trying to address these constraints uh, and really the challenge of production, which is really to anticipate, uh, to, to define the quantity and quality, to accelerate the, the uh, time uh, proof of clinical concept and, and focus on your product portfolio, reduce cost and increase flexibility and quality, leverage the evolution of bioprocess and analytics innovation, uh, and, and technologies to overcome many of these challenges that I've uh, described. Uh, and those that I'm gonna focus on um, uh, is the single-use technologies, high-throughput screening, and some of the innovation uh, in analytics. So the, where I want to spend a bit of time uh, is some of the work that we've done over the last 10 years or so is on single-use and disposable technology. Uh, now, 10 years ago, this was something that was just entering into the industry, and, and, and there was uh, issues with limited access to these uh, through vendors, um, the consistency of the products uh, being made, uh, being able to receive those products in a timely fashion. But over the 10 years, I, I can say that, you know, single-use and disposable technology has entered the mainstream in bioprocessing and vaccines, either at the bioreactor stage, the clarification, downstreaming, or the formulation and filling, uh, to the point that we see a, a number of these, pro uh, these products entering uh, the licensed manufacturing areas. So on the next slide, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but you know, it, it illustrates that the single-use bioreactors that are currently on the market. Uh, and you know, we started initially with, you know, on the left there, with the bag technology, and it's evolved into bioreactors using single-use bags um, uh, as a medium to um, be able to, uh, to change from one product to another product very quickly. Uh, as well as to um, be able to start manufacturing because it, it is much quicker, requires less validation uh, than, let's say, stainless steel. 
currently uh, we were operating this up to the 200 liter scale in our, let's say, development labs. Uh, and in, in manufacturing, um, it's reached the thousand scale, a thousand liter scale, sorry, uh, and approaching even in moving it to 2000 and beyond. So like I say, I think it's become the mainstream now of how industry is using uh, and doing their manufacturing and development using a lot of these single-use uh, bioreactors. Similarly, on the market, you can see a number of different types of depth filters uh, that are available uh, of different sizes uh, to accommodate whether your early phase development, uh, to accommodate the productivity that you're, um, that you're achieving, the type of uh, product that you need to be clarified. Uh, and again, it, it, it's reaching the point where one is uh, using this on a routine basis to develop their product. Uh, similarly, uh, some of the advances, you know, we see single-use uh, centrifuges for cell harvest and uh, clarification. Uh, again, we have several of them on the market, several of them that we are currently using uh, in our development, and they really facilitate uh, uh, the, cl the cleaning process and, and the time that it takes to change over from one product to the next or from one, one run to the next. And in, I'll show later on in the presentation that uh, some of this technology has really been able to um, improve our productivity, uh, reduce our time uh, to market, if you will, or time to product, and as well as uh, reduce the cost. Uh, again, not only the, so the chromatography as well, uh, not only centrifugation, but uh, you know, the chromatography field has also started um, to show uh, a number of products in the area. You know, we started at one time uh, a number of years ago having a closed, uh, a closed uh, chromatography um, single-use system where we would do live virus work, which was one of the first um, prototypes of that equipment uh, that we used. And it's evolved into a number of different chromatography systems uh, that are available, again, in a single-use uh, mode, which will really facilitate the amount of work and, and as well as the sizes that you can introduce this at the early phase development scale. So making a long story short, I mean, uh, this is the summary of about five to ten years of work where we've been able to implement single-use application in a closed system from benchtop to 100 liter scale process for a serum free live viral product. And this is incorporating um, a, a disposable bioreactor uh, in a dispo with a disposable mesh bag, uh, disposable mixing sy uh, systems uh, using different types of depth filters, uh, and then going through in terms of filter, uh, different types of columns disposable mix, mixing systems, other columns, and into a sterile uh, bulk drug substance bag. Uh, and again, you know, this is doing a live virus, which is a requirement, you know, that we have a closed system. Uh, and you can see from uh, this next slide that this really result was a successful demonstration uh, of virus yield, which was significantly increased from, let's say, our, our previous uh, process uh, by about tenfold, the DNA content was significantly reduced. The purification process was shortened from three to two days of operation, which in itself does not sound like a lot, but if you repeat, repeat this over time, you definitely save a significant number of operating days. Uh, we reduced it, therefore, its ease of operation, uh, no, centrifuge, no specific centrifugation. We reduced the number of production runs. Uh, and therefore the reduction uh, cost. And we are currently you know, running these at a 100 liter scale in a closed system, as I, as I had mentioned. Uh, so, I mean, I'll come back to that in one of the studies that uh, I'll show as a case example, uh, but I want to introduce a number of different type of technologies uh, that we've been looking at. One is more around the scale down in mathematical modeling. Um, and, and in this, the, the, the problem we're trying to resolve here is to ask the question, if we want to test, uh, if we want to troubleshoot a problem that's occurring at 1,000 liters, or we want to be able to, to develop a process at 1,000 liters, 
is it possible to develop this at a two liter scale, troubleshoot at a two liter scale, and then just be able to um, uh, it, it trans transfer this to a thousand liter with a high confidence of success. So the example that we show here is that we run a two, two hundred, twenty, and two hundred liter scale at let's say normal operating conditions, and what we see is a significant decrease in the productivity in terms of uh, what we what we get at the end, but also in the rate of productivity. When we spend some time to understand the engineering concepts of the fermenters and apply the same engineering conditions, operating conditions at each level, we, we generally see the rate of productivity, whether a 2 liter or 200 liters, being the same in terms of productivity and the rate of production. Uh, so the vision for this is ultimately that you know whether you, you will translate small scale development into a much larger scale, which without having to incur the time and cost of having to develop these at that large scale. And when it comes to manufacturing, if you're running, let's say, a five, 10,000 liter fermenter run and you run into some specific production problems and you want to troubleshoot and identify what that problem is and, and see if the mitigation or you know, what you have developed to resolve it will work, you can repeat those at the two or 20 liter scale, obviously, which is much easier and with confidence transfer that into a um, larger scale. Also, we've implemented a state-of-the-art filling line with using isolator technology, which really facilitates our ability to rapidly fill products in an aseptic environment uh, with confidence of uh, sterility. So if I move to the next slide, it, it, it it shows that implementing a lot of this technology was not only uh, beneficial in terms of going from, uh, let's say, fermentation to getting the drug substance, but, but it's also about filling and, and developing the drug product. And so we, with this uh, isolator uh, filling technology, we've been able to use bags, uh, let's say single-use bags, in a filling stream which will allow us to uh, mix the different components online, uh, do the final product uh, formulation, and then f and fill the vials uh, all in an aseptic and single-use mode. And again, under it, it was just demonstrating a number of the equipments that we use to develop the process in a quality de de by design uh, format. So I just want to step away from the, let's say, bioprocess part of it and really look at some of the analytical technologies that we've recently employed, which again is really in the nature of under, understanding our product better, understanding uh, when a problem is presented what the problem could be, uh, and also being able to generate this through high throughput um, systems which will allow us to, to get uh, results much faster. So we've invested significant amount of uh, time and energy and cost in terms of developing our nucleic acid detection systems around the area of mass spectrometry, uh, systems and technologies around uh, identifying the specific antigens and using affinity type approaches, as well as uh, different types of particle sizing really, again, to understand the process uh, prod, prod and our product better. And so I'll just to touch base on some of these uh, pro, uh, technologies, such as a mass spectrometer, uh, mass spectrometer in, in terms of what we're doing now and what the plans are for the future. So uh, obviously, as you know, mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry is a highly accurate uh, um, equipment for the determination of intact mass and amino acid sequence uh, in an LCMS mode uh, for identifying a target protein to look at host cell, cell protein impurities and truncations or other covalent modifications. Uh, and you know, so, and, and to give you one example that we had historically, uh, we had uh, we were doing a fermentation with E. coli. And when we sequenced the product, 
what we found was that the sequence had five amino acid residues which were different from what the target product should have been. And we were a very able, very quickly able to uh, help to figure this out through the mass spec that this was a result of uh, um, a, bi a, um, a, fruit, um, a media su supplement which was missing that needed to be added which would prevent these amino acid changes. Uh, and, and so this at that time was really uh, sig really significant in being able to, us to troubleshoot and resolve the problem very quickly. Some of the key, key challenges of single-use technology to assess antigen content uh, at multiple product stages. So you know, looking at this almost as an inline process to see from, uh, from the early upstream areas to downstream, et cetera, to uh, sort of follow the flow. Uh, and what we want to do is ex expand this in-house uh, beyond the LMS through the acquisition of uh, capillary electrophoresis instrument and develop and development. And I'll talk to, about that on um, the next slide. So with capillary electrophoresis, the application uh, really around the purity and quantification, quantification of the uh, of the vaccine. Um, uh, by this method is the quantitative stability indicating assay for vaccine antigen protein. Uh, it's been successfully and used for the quantitation of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and what we're looking for is really a screening as a replacement of the current SDS page for commercialized products. Uh, so, you know, coupling this with uh, mass spectrometry has really been a workhorse for us and really getting uh, results very quickly. Under, and again, coming back to really resolve any issues as they occur, um, and but more importantly as well, to get our um, uh, understanding of the pro process uh, much faster so that we can lead to development of a product in a, in a much quicker time period. And the last technology, uh, analytical technology, is around high-throughput sequencing. Uh, and we know we started this, oh, about seven, eight years ago, really around looking at the circle virus like a cri a crisis that was occurring and detecting a broader range of adventitious agents in our viral products. So we implemented this high throughput sequencing as an alternative to using in vivo animals or in vitro adventitious agents testing, which was time consuming uh, and costly. Uh, and we were able to use this equipment uh, with success, and we were actually the first uh, company to actually validate the use of this equipment uh, for routine uh, sequencing uh, of adventitious agents or, or that they ensuring that there are no adventitious agents within our products or, or in any of our developed products. So uh, then we want to just look at very quickly and putting these things together and, and how it improves um, our ability to develop uh, our products. So here we did a comparison of which I would call um, a conventional approach of using at that time conventional chroma column chromatography, uh, SDS, SDS page and Western blots for analysis uh, versus high throughput systems in which we're using high throughput technology with low volume systems, uh, electrophorograms uh, and virtual gel analysis, and, and as well as affinity type um, systems that allow for um, quant quantification and, and purity. And when we, we did this in a mode of, as demonstrated by the next slide, in a uh, sort of design of experiment, experiment, experiments, uh, where we did high throughput process development through uh, high process testing capabilities where we would get in high, low volume, high number of, uh, let's say, well plate, 96 well plate format for uh, high throughput sample preparation, uh, high throughput analysis, again, in a 96 well format, and then uh, method scouting studies, high throughput generation, um, and almost like a circular uh, mech, uh, flow in terms of really enhancing how we do things. So to come back to, to, come back to uh, the comparison, so you can imagine the conventional approach, which required 50 ml columns versus a six, 600 microliter column, SDS page versus 96 well uh, liquid chromatography, uh, and 
didn't compare that in terms of uh, the experimental runs for this length, 24 studies which took 50 days versus high throughput six days, sample analysis eight days versus only two days, and total number of days required to get the results was uh, you know, from 58 down to eight days. So significant increase uh, in our productivity, a reduction in time and cost in terms of getting the information that we need to move forward. So with that, I know that was a quick uh, go through uh, in terms of uh, what we're currently doing. Uh, we are looking at continuous manufacturing uh, as a mode, as our other companies. Uh, transform uh, we're looking at transformative technologies such as mRNA. I think a big uh, area uh, is around the data management. Uh, so as you can appreciate, as we're looking for a lot of high throughput technologies, it really generates a lot of data. Uh, and you really have to couple then that data management, artificial intelligence, and machine learning uh, together to really be able to extract uh, and benefit from the data that you get. Uh, the scaled-down modeling I talked about, and there's more work to do there. Uh, molecular imprinting, you know, which has been really around raw material uh, uh, testing, as well as uh, even to the point of, let's say, resin design, uh, novel adjuvants, uh, and then novel expression systems. So with that, I mean, I want to thank you for your uh, indulgence uh, and participation in the presentation and look forward to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Tony. Now we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar, but once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions in via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. Now, our first question, Tony, is, is single-use technology cheaper in the long run? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question, Stephen, and it's a question that comes up uh, in, uh, let's say, many of the different conferences that I presented or I've, I've been to where there's always a discussion around, you know, at the end, if I change my stainless steel bioreactors and my full stainless steel infrastructure to single use, is it cheaper? Now, from a development perspective, we can't, we, we haven't quantified the cost per se, but what we can say is we're able to do our work faster, uh, in less, so in less time, uh, requiring less experiments, uh, and, and therefore, and less raw materials. <clears throat> so I would say from that perspective, yes, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, it is cheaper. Uh, now, w one thing that one has to take in mind is that you do need to keep an inventory of the single-use um, uh, equi uh, equipment, uh, tubing, etc. But when you compare that of what the cost it is to validate a fermenter, what it costs, to do your um, cleaning validation, what it costs to change over from one run to the next, <clears throat> and the depreciation of that equipment, uh, at the end, <clears throat> I'm confident that it's cheaper. Thank you. Our next question is, will single-use technology, closed system, be fully implemented in manufacturing? Uh, <clears throat> I've, I've shown that from a development perspective, we were to go completely uh, closed and single use up to 100 liter scale. Now, as you increase the scale, and if it's a more complex manufacturing process, what you'll find is that there's a, a large number of different tubings, uh, uh, let's say different uh, number of connections Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, which may make it more difficult. So it is possible, uh, but I would say that for sure a large portion of the manufacturing uh, part of it can be single use. Obviously, with the vision, with the vision to be fully uh, closed. Um, but I think you know the it will be that your what you're trying to manufacture, which will dictate, uh, let's say, how close to completely closed that you can get. Thank you for that. Our next question for you, Tony, is based on the progress you outlined. 
What do you think are the next barriers to overcome? Oh, I think, uh, no, I think that was probably where I was heading with the last slide. So, you know, as we're generating a lot of this data, and you know, we were really generating a lot of data with all the sequence work that we're doing, all the high throughput screening, uh, you, you begin to get under, let's say, overwhelming information, a lot of data. And then the, the, the question, the concern comes to how do I effectively capture all this data? And more importantly, how do I effectively analyze this data so I can leverage that information to allow me to really develop, understand my process and troubleshoot and manufacturing in a much uh, uh, rapid uh, time period. So that's, that's one area that I think uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to overcome, how to manage this. And if you think of your own areas where you're working, uh, the level of data that you have, and to just think about, okay, how do I manage this? How do I extract it? Uh, how do I leverage it? How do, and, and when you're looking at an overall process, how do I keep that whole process flow of data uh, becomes, a, becomes a challenge. The other is the uh, around continuous manufacturing. Um, and, and with this, although the concept of continuous manufacturing is, um, is intriguing, uh, it, and, and the output of it, which is really around reducing your overall footprint, uh, increasing your productivity in a shorter period of time, uh, it does mean trying to run something on, on, on a fully continuous basis, which is sort of uh, in the paradox with how you define what your what, what let's say one lot is. So if you're making and you know we make material, we, we give a lot numbers to that. So in a continuous manufacturing, how do you define your uh, lot number and and maybe more of a regulatory quality uh, discussion as opposed to an actual technical um, ability to do it. But I think we can, if not completely continuous, I think we can get much closer to continuous and reduce the footprint and cost uh, of our manufacturing areas. And the last barrier to overcome is uh, the technology of the future, because some of those technologies, uh, CRISPR, um, mRNA, or other technologies that are being developed could fundamentally change uh, the industry, and are we are we ready for that type of change? Because if you know those changes could come overnight, and they could be quite significant and have a significant impact on how you currently make things. And our final question is: What do you think about continuous manufacturing? Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think I may have already answered that one. Yeah. Uh, like I say, I think from a principle, it makes uh, a lot of sense. I think from a uh, output in terms of what you can get from it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of how, you know, reducing your footprint, uh, you know, you running things at a smaller scale but, but on a more continuous uh, scale. Uh, the name uh, which implies that these, you know, continuous, I mean, it, it's forever running. Uh, it may not be the case, uh, but I think running systems at smaller scales for a longer time period and then sort of being closer to continuous, I, I think is probably something that uh, we will see happening within the industry. Thank you for your answers. And with that, I shall conclude the Q&A session. But thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Before I finish the webinar, I would like to ask our presenter, Tony Diamore, if he has any closing remarks or final statements. Uh, no, thank you. Thanks again, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for your, you know, participating in this. I mean, I, the only, I guess, same as, the, the, um, uh, as my start, I think, you know, we all strive uh, to do uh, work in a much faster, uh, let's say, in a much more economical fashion. Uh, we have to, therefore, be on the cutting edge of technology as much as possible, which will really facilitate being able to do that. Uh, and so I think innovation technology has to be part of the uh, decision-making 
uh, as you take on, you know, process development or analytics. Well, thank you, for, thank you for those words. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, Tony Diamore, for sharing your knowledge with us. And I'd like to remind our audience that they can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Okay, well, thank you. Bye, everyone.